Well, welcome to the Seven Figure Builder Show. My name is Julie Baranek, founder of Seven Figure Builder, where we help high achieving CEOs connect with their dream clients to scale to seven figures and beyond. And I'm here today with my friend, Jeff Goldberg. Hey, Jeff. Hey, how's it going, Julie? I am fabulous today. It is gorgeous here, and I am happy to talk to you. <laughs> me too. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. So first and foremost, where in the world are you? Oh, I'm on Long Island in a little town called Long Beach. It's a little barrier island off the south shore of Long Island. You have to take a bridge to get here. Uh, it's only about three blocks wide. So everybody who lives, it's very neighborhoody because everybody who lives here does it for one reason. It's because we love the beach. I'm a block yeah. from the ocean. Oh, that's gorgeous. That's an absolutely yeah. beautiful area. It doesn't awesome. suck. No, not at all. Even though it gets a little chilly in the wintertime, I'll, I'll give it that. You're a little bit north of me, but you're actually pretty darn close to me. <laughs> yeah, I, I still go swimming all, all winter long. I have a, a bunch of wetsuits of various weights, so I can be in the water in January and February if I want to. You're braver than I am. I'll give you that. <laughs> braver or crazier. I'm not sure which, but uh, whichever one works. Combination of both. So for those that haven't had the pleasure to meet you yet, can you tell us a bit about your business? Sure. So uh, my company's name is Jeff Goldberg and Associates. By the way, you wouldn't believe how much I had to pay a marketing guy to come up with that name. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we're a sales training and coaching firm. So I work with both individuals and organizations internationally to help them do one thing and one thing only, increase their sales. I guarantee you, nobody's hiring me for my good looks. So I go in and I work with salespeople and sales managers. I have programs that train sales managers how to be more effective uh, leaders and coaches. And for salespeople, I teach them things like how to get more appointments with decision makers, how to shorten their sales cycle, and just how to close more business more profitably. Uh, I do sales training, which is, is exactly what it sounds like. I come in and teach that. I do sales coaching, which can be done one-on-one -on -one or in small groups. And I just recently launched a series of online sales training videos for both prospecting and selling that anybody uh uh, would find useful, except if you're at the expert level. So for somebody who's just starting out in sales, it's perfect. For somebody who's been in sales a while, but is not really achieving the success they want, it's perfect. And for entrepreneurs, your audience, people who are good at what they do, but may not know how to sell, also perfect. Yeah, no, absolutely. And this is, I love to geek out in this area. So I'm excited to talk with you about it, but it's something right. not just for salespeople, right? Like it's all business owners. It's across really all aspects of our lives that we end up encountering this, right? Well, it's anyone who is a business owner who, as part of their responsibilities, has to develop business. So right. if you're a business owner and you have salespeople that work for you, you don't have to be involved. You don't need this program. But, you know, like if you're an accountant, you're running your solo solo accounting practice. You're a great accountant, but you can't get enough clients. Perfect. Yeah. Uh, and, 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 look, I believe that all of us are selling all day long, every day anyways, whether we're professional salespeople or not. Uh, you know, if you're uh, trying to talk your kids into doing something, you're selling them on it. If you're if you're trying to get your your wife to go on a date with you on Friday night, you're selling it. You're always selling your ideas. But for entrepreneurs, uh, especially solopreneurs, they not only have to perform whatever whatever service or product they have, they've also got to sell that. And it's it's. I always say sales is not the most difficult gig in the world. You know, it beats digging ditches in the hot sun. I assume <laughs> because I've never dug ditches in the hot sun, but it's not an easy gig. So. Um, I, I help make it easy for people by teaching them a, an easy to implement and easy to use process. Awesome. And I was going to ask, so how how do you simplify this? Because for most people, they get either stage fright, they hate it, they just they they just hate the whole process. <laughs> like I'll just be honest, yeah. right? I started that way. I really struggled with it. I've since like shifted my mindset a lot and really dug into to learning and and just you know really studying the big experts. So how do you break this down and make it simple? Yeah, well, th th there's two reasons why people uh, don't like it. Uh, one is they just don't know how, so they're not good at it. But the other one is that most people have a built-in aversion to salespeople. They think our job is to lie, cheat, steal, do anything that we need to do in order to reach our hands into their pockets, pull out green pieces of pictures uh, of paper with pictures of dead presidents on them and put them into our own pocket. And certainly there are some salespeople who are, thieves and liars and, and scumbags, but that's really not what most professional salespeople are. Most professional salespeople come from a place of service. That's certainly what I teach the people that I work with. Your job is to serve the prospect and help them choose to become your customer. So how do I make it simple? By making it easy to use. That you know, I, I still read almost every book that comes out. I still go to seminars and I've been in sales 48 years, but there's always something that I can learn, you know, that you don't know what somebody else has come up with. But um, a lot of the a lot of the 
things I hear and a lot of the things I read, they're, they're great ideas, but they're hard to do. Everything I do is simple. And that's because I want it simple for me. My, my oldest daughter, Avery, just graduated college in uh, May. She graduated from the University of Virginia with a degree in aerospace engineering. Wow. She's literally, literally a rocket scientist. Wow. But you don't have to be a rocket scientist to be in sales. So it, it's a simple six steps. You know, how do you meet people for the first time on a sales call, whether it's via Zoom or in person or on the phone? And how do you get them to like you and trust you? Because while many things have changed over the last 50 years, one thing that hasn't is people still do business, unless they have no choice, they still do business with people that they both like and trust. And of the two, by the way, the trust is more important. Then you have to gain the right to ask questions and ask a bunch of them because that's truly what selling is all about. Selling is not about your incredible ability to present and it's not about your strong closing skills. Those are both lovely to have, but those aren't what makes a great salesperson. A great salesperson is someone who knows how to ask the right questions and ask them in a way that gets people to open up conversationally. From there, we have to confirm the answers that we heard, that we think we heard, to make sure that we heard the right thing. We have to make a presentation based on four elements. I teach people how to negotiate. And then, of course, how do you actually ask for the business? And there's nothing fancy. There's nothing tricky. I, I don't believe in tricks. I, I like magic, but salespeople are not magicians. I really teach, how do you be straightforward with people? How do you engage with them in a conversation that hopefully ends up with them choosing to do business with you? Because Julie, I can tell you this, as good as you may be at selling and as good as I know I am at selling, neither of us put together, we're not good enough to talk anybody into anything that they don't want, don't need, or can't afford. And by the way, I wouldn't want to. So it's just an easy to use. If you can have a conversation, you can sell if you're conscious about it and you do it with purpose. And again, you're coming from the right place, which is how do I best serve this person, this prospect? Absolutely. And how, I love what you mentioned about the questions. How does curiosity play into that? Oh boy, it's the essence of selling. Most people think it is about your strong closing skills and your great presentation skills, but the best salespeople actually always have three qualities. And the first one is they are the best question askers. They're great interviewers. That means that they have credibility because all great interviewers have credibility. And you establish that in the beginning of, of the sales process when you're first meeting with people. And, and you're, you're trying to discover, as opposed to what most sales trainers will teach you, uh, they'll teach you find the need or find the pain. If you can find the need and fill it, you'll get a customer. If you find the pain and fix it, you'll get a customer. And I'm certainly not saying that's wrong, but I believe that leaves a lot of business on the table. What I look to find out in the questions that I'm asking and what I teach people to ask is what makes sense to the people, to the person or people that you're trying to sell to regarding what you have to sell them? And I'll explain that because it's, 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 oh, that sounds good, Jeff, but what are you, what are you talking right. about? How do you so, do that? Yeah. Well, not, not just how do you do it, but what do you mean by that? So we do everything we do because it makes sense to do those things. You and I are having this conversation for your podcast right now because it made sense for you to invite me and it made sense for me to be here. Um, did you eat breakfast this morning? I did. Why? Because I didn't want to be my blood sugar crashing and it made sense for me to have clear, you know, clarity of mind. Yeah, absolutely. It made sense. Uh, I, he's laying behind me, so I have to spell this. I W-A-L-K-E-D, the D-O-G, before we got on this call because I didn't want him bothering me while we were having this conversation. It made sense to do that. I unplugged my phone, my landline, and I turned off my cell phone. I didn't want to be interrupted. So we do everything we do because it makes sense to do those things, including buy stuff. So what we want to do, the questions we want to ask our prospects are the questions that uncover for us what makes sense to the prospect regarding what we have to sell them. And if that's not clear enough, I'll give you a quick example, which I promise clarifies it. I've done this once before, once or twice before. I'm sure. So um, let's say you're the vice president of sales at a large company with 100 salespeople. That's a good lead for me. And I need to know what makes sense to you about what I have to sell you. In other words, what makes sense to you about training your salespeople? So I'm going to ask questions like this. Hey, Julie, I'm just curious about something. When a brand new salesperson joins your team, brand new, first day, what kind of training programs do you have in place now to get them up to speed? And then I do the most difficult thing for salespeople to do, Julie, which is shut up. 
Uh-huh. Stop talking. Silence can be your best friend in sales. And I just let them talk. And what's going to happen is you, the vice president of sales with 100 salespeople, you're going to explain to me what makes sense to you about training your brand new salespeople. Now, here's the cool thing about this. What you say might be, Jeff, we don't do anything right now. That's why we're talking to you, which means up until now, it's made sense to you to not train your salespeople. Or you might say, we use Miller Hyman or we use Sandler or any of a million other sales training organizations or individuals, which means up until now, it's made sense to you to do that. We send them to the seminars. We haven't watched YouTube videos. We haven't read books. It actually doesn't matter what you answer. I mean, it does matter because I need to know it, but I don't care what you answer as long as you explain to me what makes sense to you about training your brand new salespeople, because what makes sense is whatever you're doing now, whatever you've done in the past. So now you answer that question. And then I'm going to follow it up with this one. All right, that's great, Julie. But let's say somebody's been on your team three, four, maybe five months. They're not killing it yet. Maybe they've fallen into a couple of sales by accident. What programs do you have in place to get them to the next level? And then you're going to explain to me what makes sense to you about taking your not brand new salespeople, but still fairly new salespeople to the next level. And then I have 75 more questions behind those two, all designed to tell me one thing, What makes sense to you about training your salespeople? Because when it comes time for me to present my solution to you, tell you what I'm going to do for you, it's going to sound something like this. Well, Julie, here's how you're training your salespeople now. And here's how Jeff Goldberg and Associates can help you do it better. Because when I show you a better way, it should make better sense. And if people buy because it makes sense, and they do, you should become my customer. Now, this does not mean that I close everybody. I don't. Nobody does. Even people who say they do still don't. It's, 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 a, it's, common, uh, it's a common lie that I hear all, oh, Jeff, I close 100%. No. Really? I should be taking your seminar <laughs> instead of you coming to mine. But yeah, I'm going to ask those questions and find that out to see, is this a real prospect or not? And can I actually help them? And when you ask enough questions and you share with them, here's a better way, you'll close way more people than how the typical salesperson sells, which sounds like this. Hey, Julie, thank you so much for your time today. Really glad we could get together. I'm sure you're very busy, so I'm going to get right to the point. Let me tell you why Jeff Goldberg and Associates is the greatest sales training and coaching firm in the world. And then I throw up all over you. I've now said that. What you do, people shut down. Yeah, so it doesn't work. So yeah, I teach a very conversational, easy, easy flowing way to sell. Yeah, and I love that. And I always liken it to like going to the doctor, right? Like you can walk in the front door of the doctor and they diagnose you and write a prescription immediately and you're shut down, like uh, you don't even know what's wrong with me, right? Before they even ask you questions, like you need to ask those questions before you can make a diagnosis to see if it even helps the person. Absolutely, 100%. Look, I'd love to say that I can help any company in the world that employs salespeople who speak English. But the truth is, I don't know that till I get there. Mm -hmm. Now, in the 18 years that I've owned my own company, I've only gone on three sales calls with people who were interested in sales training where I said, you know what? I don't have anything for you. You're doing everything right. You don't need me at all. Because usually there are some gaps and their salespeople can always be improved. But yeah, that's all I'm looking for. I'm looking for the people who are looking to improve themselves or their sales team and, and aren't happy with what's going on now. And let's face it, most people are not thrilled with their results in sales. And it's because they don't treat it like a real job. They don't read the books. They don't go to the seminars. They don't educate themselves. I can tell you this, Julie, anytime I visit my doctor, which fortunately is not very often, I'm a healthy guy, but he's always got books on his desk. He's studying. Anytime I go to one of my lawyers, unfortunately, they always have books on their desk. They're studying. Sales is a career. And if you want to make a lot of money, it's a truly incredible opportunity to do so uh, if you're willing to put in the effort to learn how. And by the way, I'm a college dropout. And as we Jewish people say, I do all right. Yes, for sure. So how, how do you help people handle objections? Is it like waiting until they happen or trying to prevent them by building rapport? Like, what is your take with that? Well, great question, by the way. Uh, I'm not looking to prevent objections. Actually, I'm looking to uncover them, but I'm looking to do it as early as I possibly can. So the way most trainers will teach you to handle objections is it always comes at the end of the sales process after you've asked for people's business and you've gotten your objections. And by the way, when I teach, I also leave that for the end, but that's not where I want you to uncover the objections. You should be uncovering as many objections as you possibly can in the information gathering stage. And here's why. Uh, first of all, if you've been in sales for more than two weeks, you've already heard every objection you're ever going to hear. 
So it's not like you're, you're not going to hear 100. Uh, I've worked with major companies, uh, as well as tiny firms that you and I never heard of. But I, I mean, I've worked with Cisco Systems and Siemens and Aramark and State Farm and Citibank. I've never met one that gets more than five objections. I only get two or three. Uh, so there's no reason you shouldn't be prepared for them. And if you're prepared for them, you should pull them out of the person in advance. And here's why you want to do that. If you wait till you get to the end of the sales process and say, will you buy from me in whatever words you're going to use? And then and somebody says no, and, that, and they give you the objection. Now you're fighting an uphill battle. Why would I want to do that? I was married for 10 years. I don't need to fight any more uphill battles. I'd rather uncover the objections as early as I possibly can in the process because A, if I cannot help the prospect get past that objection, why would I want to waste my time going through the rest of the process if I can't help them, if I can't help them get past whatever is in the way? And B, why would I want to fight that uphill battle? I want to find out as early as possible so I can help them get past that and then move on. And by the way, I will actually, I teach people to bring up objections. Like there's something I call an every time objection. And it's exactly what it sounds like. It's the objection that you get almost every time when you sell. Well, if you get an objection, the vast majority of the time when you're selling, you might as well bring it up early on in the conversation and discover, can I get rid of this or not? Like, here's an example. I often get to the end of my process and people will say, especially with large corporations, you know, because uh, often we're doing a, a long-term engagement and I'll often hear this, wow, that's a lot of money. Now, they didn't say it's too expensive. They just said, that's a lot of money. You know why? I don't work cheap. I'm really, really good at what I do and I don't work cheap. So I'm fine with somebody saying that's a lot of money, but I'd rather uncover that early on. So in my brief commercial, early on in the process where I'm establishing rapport with people and gaining the right to ask questions, it actually ends like this. By the way, Julie, even though we're not the least expensive option and we're not, People choose Jeff Goldberg and Associates because when we leave, their salespeople get more appointments with decision makers. They have a shorter sales cycle and they just plain close more business more profitably. So if I'm hearing, wow, that's a lot of money every time, I'm bringing it up anyways. I'm bringing it up right at the beginning of the process, about, about 10 minutes into a meeting. So if, you, if, if you've got an issue with money, I want to find out now. The mm -hmm. last thing I want to do is come back two or three times and then find out, oh, I can't afford that. I don't have that kind of money. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, I think that's huge what you just talked about, but when we have objections from a customer perspective, a lot of times they're also blocking our, our mental state from moving forward. Like you always have this nagging thing of, I know I can't afford this guy. So why are we even having this? And I don't hear anything that you say after that. Right. So the more you can uncover those objections and bring them out into the open, address them, help them move past that, then they can actually hear the rest of what it is you're trying to say and how you can actually help them. Perfect. That's exactly right. You want to get it out. So they're not sitting the whole time and thinking, wow, I wonder how much this is. I probably can't afford it. You want to get it out as early as you possibly can to, to judge, is it worth your time to continue this process? Because here's something I slam home constantly with all my clients, but especially my coaching clients. You've got to value your time. Of course, you're going to respect your prospect's time, but guess whose time I respect more? Mine. Yeah. I respect yeah. my time because time is the one thing you can't get back. You can always make more money. You can almost always regain your health if you get sick. Not always, but almost always. But the one thing you cannot get back is time. So I don't want to waste a second with somebody who's not really a prospect, can't afford what I have to offer, or has any other good reason why they don't want to do business with me. And I, by the way, I understand not everybody's going to do business with me, but why would I want to waste my time with somebody who has no intention of doing business with me or can't afford it? I'd rather leave them with a good impression, shake their hand, tell them I'm glad we could invest this time together, ask for referrals, and then leave skid marks in their driveway getting to the next prospect who might help me feed my kids. Because that's the way I look at it. Every moment I waste is a moment that's preventing me from taking care of my children in the way I want to take care of them. Absolutely. And how how do you, would you say that like tone and behavior factors into the conversation and building that trust and rapport with your, your prospects? They're crucial, of course. Uh, obviously, your behavior matters. If you walk in and you've got an angry look on your face, and you're you know throwing things around and being an a hole. People aren't going to develop that like and trust that you need. Uh, and your tone is crucial. Um, there was a study done years and years ago. Uh, everything seems like years and years ago now, but it was it was done in the mid '80s and it was repeated in the early '90s. I, I always forget which California college. It was a joint uh, study between MIT on the East Coast and either UCLA or USC, I can't remember which one, but it studied how people understand you when you communicate with them face-to-face -face 
as opposed to over the phone. It was fascinating. In face-to-face communications, 55% of how somebody understands you is based on your body language. And they included everything in, under body language there, including if they're close enough to smell your, uh, you, uh, count the corn in your teeth if you just had and all that counted. 38% is based on your tone of voice. And 7% is based on your words. That's not to say that words aren't important for salespeople. Of course they are. But tone of voice is crucial. And by the way, if you sell over the phone or if you make appointments over the phone, it gets worse. 84% of how somebody understands you is based on your tone of voice. And only 16% is your words. And of course, because it's over the phone, there's no body language. So yes, tone is crucial in sales. Uh, Again, unless you have what they want, and they can't get it anywhere else. People are not going to do with business with somebody they don't like or don't trust. So you can't be an arrogant a-hole uh, unless you are in the enviable position to have what somebody wants and they can't get it anywhere else, which is not true for me and probably not true for you either. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, to that, I always think about like people rarely remember the words that you say, but they always remember how you make them feel. Right? And when you're building that no like and trust love relationship with them, it comes back to how did you make them feel, which always comes back to your behavior, your tone, like all that ties together along with the words you say, of course, they're important, like you said, but you know, they all, they all definitely tie together to build that relationship with people. Absolutely. I I love that you brought that up because one of the things I impart to people is you want to make your prospect feel special. You want to really pay attention to them. It's not about you. It's about the prospect. Most salespeople think we get paid to talk. I get paid to talk, but not when I'm selling. I get paid to talk when I'm training or coaching, but not when I'm selling. So I, I want to make sure that I'm doing everything I possibly can to be the kind of person that people like, to make people feel good. And one of the best ways to do that is make them be the center of attention, mm-hmm. make it all about them. Dale Carnegie said, it's better to be interested than interesting. And Mary Kay Ash, the founder of Mary Kay Cosmetics, had a saying, make every person you meet feel special, make them feel important, act as if they have a sign hanging around their neck that says, make me feel important. She says, not only will you succeed in sales, but you'll succeed in life. And I completely agree. Yeah, absolutely. And I love I love what you said there is as a salesperson, often you think people get paid to talk, but really you get paid to listen. Like you get paid for active listening to understand the pain points that they have and how you can connect the dots with them to what it is you're ultimately trying to help them out with, right? With your with your services or your products. Once again, you're right on point. And, and I like that you use the term that I use all the time, active listening. There's active listening and there's passive listening. Passive listening is what most of us do most of the time which is I'm listening to you, but I'm really just waiting for you to stop talking so I can get out my next bit of brilliance. And I'm not really focused on what you're saying. That yeah. doesn't work. Yeah. After, active listening. And there's like a 20 minute example that I, I do when I'm training people on this. So I'm not going to waste your time with it. But active listening is listening as if your life depends on it, as if your very life depends on you listening to what the other person is saying. Now, here's the thing. Does your life depend on it when you're selling? Of course not. But your livelihood does. Yeah. Each and every conversation has the possibility of you helping somebody choose to do business with you and you and your company making money so that you can do all the things that you have to do, like take care of the dogs, like just I, I have to take care of my dog and I have an ex-wife that needs to get paid each month and two of my three kids are still in college, blah, blah. We all have stuff. So unless you're coming from a place of truly, I want to help this person and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do my best to do that, you're not going to be able to close business, especially if, you don't, if they don't like you. And the best way to get people to like you is be interested in them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. People like to talk about themselves. And even if you can't help that person, they likely have somebody else that you can. And if you make them feel good and feel informed, feel special, you know, you're more likely to actually get that referral down the road. Julie, you've either studied this or you're a natural because I say that all the time. (laughs) Even people who say, I don't like to talk about myself actually like to talk about themselves if you ask the right questions and listen actively. And listening actively, you know, look people in the eye, take notes occasionally, make encouraging sounds. Like one of my favorite things to do when somebody is telling me about themselves, which is the first thing I have them do to establish rapport, is I'm making encouraging sounds and noises like, "Uh uh-huh, really? No kidding. Hmm. Why'd you do that? I'm encouraging them to talk as long as they possibly can about their favorite subject themselves. And I... Well, when I'm selling coaching, I sell to sales managers and salespeople and entrepreneurs. When I'm selling sales training, I'm typically dealing with a vice president of sales or above, or a president or CEO, vice president, senior vice president, executive vice president, or a president or CEO. These are big ego people. 
typically, me too, by the way, I'm not blaming them. I'm a big ego person too. You, you kind of have to be in sales to succeed. But my whole job is how do I let them do the, be the star? Let, be, let them be the center of attention because on a subconscious basis, when you let the other person be the star, they start thinking unconsciously, huh, this chef's a nice guy. I think I like him. Not the typical salesperson. First of all, he didn't thank me for my time, which by the way, I absolutely never do. Do not start a sales call by thanking people for their time. I understand that's the way most of us have been trained. And I understand we've all been trained to bow down to the almighty prospect. But when you thank people for their time up front, what you've done is you've elevated them and you've lowered yourself. Well, why would somebody trust you to, to hand over their money and whatever for whatever they're buying? Why would somebody hire me to train their sales team? In other words, to hopefully ensure their, their future. Uh, why would they do that if they didn't trust me and respect me? So when you thank people for their time right off the bat, you're lowering yourself. Now, I believe word choices are incredibly important in sales. I believe one word can be the difference between closing a deal or not. So rather than thank you so much for your time today, I would rather start a meeting with, hey, Julie, I'm really glad we could invest some time together today. I'm really glad we could invest some time together today. And what, what word typically comes or what phrase comes to mind when we say the word invest? ROI, return on investment. So right. sales is mostly psychology and little things like that make a huge difference. Yeah, totally. And with that, I mean, it all comes back to confidence. Like you said about ego, right? Like you have an ego, they have an ego, but I think a lot of it, yes, there's always ego involved, but there's confidence involved. And when you're a confident person and you're showing interest in say me, the VP, right, then it's, it elevates my ego confidence that much more because now somebody with confidence, it's not somebody like pandering to me, right? That just breaks down that relationship versus building it up and building that trust and that rapport. You're absolutely right. Again, it, it has to be sincere. Now, I happen to be wired up, curious. I'm a curious guy by nature. I know not everybody is, but like one of my favorite shows on TV is How Things Are Made. Have you ever seen that? I love that show. <laughs> oh my God. So for your listeners and viewers who don't know, it, uh, it, it, it runs all the time. I think it's on, not Discovery, it might be the, the Science his, Channel. I think or the something. History or something, yeah. History Channel. I think you're yeah. right, yeah. So every episode, they have three different things that get manufactured and it shows you how that how the thing is made. Like, how do they make a crayon? How do they make a tennis racket? How do they make frozen waffles? It's fascinating. I love that stuff. So I'm wired up curious anyways. But if you're not, you have to act like you're curious. Be curious about the other person. When you're interested in them, you're more interesting to them. Here, here and Look, I'll share this with your audience. Here's how I establish rapport with the VP of sales. Hey, Julie, I'm just curious before we get started. How'd you get to be the vice president of sales here at Julie Co? I'm just curious. These are the exact words. Yeah. I'm just curious. Before we get started, how'd you get to be the vice president of sales here at Julico? Now, I'm just curious is what I call a softener. It's a word or a phrase that you put before a question, which softens it and makes it more conversational. I'm just curious out of curiosity, by the way, these are all softeners. I'm just curious before we get started. We're not even starting the sales call yet. It's just you and me talking about your favorite subject, you. How'd you get to be the vice president of sales here at Julico? And then I just shut up and let you explain to me. And usually what I get is between four to seven minutes of their resume. I went to school here, then I got a job there, then I got a promotion, then I got recruited away. And again, all I'm doing is actively listening, paying attention to what they're saying, encouraging them to talk longer so that they start lowering their defenses because people have a built up wall when a salesperson is talking to them. It's the wall that they use to protect themselves because we, you have to understand how brain science works. The way brain science works when we're making a buying decision is the brain automatically goes to the negative first to protect itself from making a bad decision. What if I engage with Julie and I don't get more leads? What if I hire Jeff to train my sales team and my sales don't increase? What if I look bad to my boss? What if I get fired? The brain does that. By the way, this is not good or bad, right or wrong. That's just what the brain does to protect itself from making a bad decision. So we salespeople have to do everything we possibly can during every interaction with our prospect to help them lower that resistance. We can't do it for them. You can't sell them out of making a bad decision. They have to come to that decision on their own, but it's our job to help them do that if it's right for them. Right. So they can think it was their idea, right? <laughs> It is their idea. Yeah, I'm just guiding sure. them in the right direction. And by the way, uh, it's not always to do business with me. I, I have two main competitors here. On, I mean, I have lots and lots of competitors, but two main competitors right here on Long Island. I've sometimes referred them when I meet somebody because you know what? 
I'm not the right person for you. Let me introduce you to Adrian, or let me introduce you to Rich, but really good at what they do. Or if somebody says, um, gee, I can't afford that. Got it. No problem. Let me introduce you to my competitors. They both work, both work less expensively than me, both very good. So it, it, it all, again, all boils down to uh, uh, an acronym that I've taught my kids from a very young age, which is ADTRT, always do the right thing. And if I'm not the right thing for your for my prospect, I don't have to wait for them to tell me. I'll tell them. Now, again, it doesn't happen very often, but always do the right thing. You don't have to lie, cheat, and steal to be in sales. One of the most important things to me is not just serving my customer, but my prospect, but to be able to sleep at night while I'm doing it. Yeah, totally. I think that's important. For sure. And you've been doing this for a while, but tell us a little bit about your journey of how you got here. And I know you also have some other talents that you haven't shared with our listeners. Well, like, like most people, I, uh, I fell into sales by accident. I was going to college in Manhattan and uh, wasting my time because I had no interest in anything uh, other than partying and uh, going to my psychology and marketing classes because those were the only two I, I was interested in. And I took a part-time job in a furniture store a block away uh, doing customer service and ordering things like that. And on one Saturday, one of the salespeople called in sick and we were very busy. And the boss looked at me and said, Jeff, see those people in the old lobby? Go sell them. And I'm like, I don't know how to sell. And no kidding. This is, I will exaggerate a story to make a point or to be funny, but literally he went like this for those viewers who are listening. I'm, you know, pushing up my mouth, uh, my <laughs> mouth with my fingers and a smile. He made a smile. He goes, smile a lot, follow them around, write down what they want, come back. I'll give you the prices that's selling. And 48 years later, I'm still doing selling. Uh, I, I've done, I've sold all different kinds of things. I've owned a headhunting firm for a while. I went to work uh, for a sales training company and then opened up my own uh, 18 years ago. And I haven't looked back. I love being an entrepreneur and I, I love, I love being my own boss and being able to do whatever I want, whenever I want. And uh, I mentioned that I, I live a block from the beach. I mean, I set up my life that during the summer, I do my very best that by two or three o'clock, I'm done with work and I'm sitting on the beach, sipping some tequila and uh, going for a swim. Uh, the other thing you're talking about is um, I do stand up comedy. Uh, I, I've used comedy uh, and humor to keep people awake and involved because typically people bring me in and I do full day seminars, you know, seven, eight hours. And as fascinating as I think I am, I think it could get a little boring listening to me drone on for seven or eight hours at a time. So I've always used humor to keep people awake and involved and engaged. And uh, two years ago, I was talking to my coach and she said, you know, uh, Every now and then you step over the line, you say something that might be slightly inappropriate in front of a corporate audience. Why don't you get an outlet for that? I'm like, what the hell am I going to do? And she goes, go do stand-up comedy. This was two years ago. And I said, yeah. Liz, I'm 66 years old. I'm not changing careers now. And she said, Jeff, they do it at night. Go work during the day and then go do stand-up at night. And sure enough, I signed up for a class. And seven weeks later, I was in front of 300 people at the wow. biggest club on Long Island performing and I haven't stopped yet. It's, it's, it's heavenly. It's just, it's an addiction. It's like, there's nothing better than giving people the gift of laughter. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I love how you combine the two, right? Like in your sales uh, techniques, your training, all of that, when you can bring comedy into it, obviously it lightens the mood. It keeps people interested and, you know, it, it disarms people in a natural, authentic way, which is really cool. Absolutely. Not only that, uh, I recently worked with a, a, a co-writer and I wrote a 30 minute set of comedy all about selling all stories from my past, which I plan. I haven't marketed it yet, but I plan to market it to large organizations for their quarterly or annual sales meetings. You know, get your salespeople together. We'll tr uh, I'll do 30 minutes of comedy and give them 30, 30 minutes of sales tips. Nice. I love that. That is really cool. So you've accomplished a ton in your career, professionally, you know, personally, and in your comedy career, but how do you define success? What does that look like for you? Wow, that's a good one. Um, success is being able to do whatever you want to do and not have to worry about the money. Success is having people in your life that you love and who love you back. And to me, success is having a dog. Uh, <laughs> uh, I really believe that dogs are the the best thing on the planet. Uh, you know, being able to hang out with my buddy and do whatever I want, whenever I want that that's real success. As far as I'm concerned, obviously not hurting anyone and contributing as much as you possibly can. Uh, uh, I find that when I'm doing comedy, it, it, it not only feels good because people are feeding my ego by laughing at my jokes, but I'm giving them, I truly do consider laughter a gift. Uh, a, a dear friend of mine who was very encouraging when I first started out, had the great honor of meeting Robin Williams uh, oh, wow. and talking to him after Robin had seen him perform. And he said to my friend, Greg, he goes, Greg, 
keep doing what you're doing. Keep making people laugh because you never know how you're affecting somebody's life when you give them the gift of laughter. I love that. That is, yeah, incredible. And you never know where people are at, whether they're in a dark place or not a dark place. And if you can lighten their spirits, that's priceless. Well, I, I'm glad you said that because I'll take a very, I'll make this very quick. But uh, Greg tells another story. I'm sharing Greg's stories instead of mine. <laughs> uh, Greg tells a story of uh, he was doing stand up in um, Toronto, mm -hmm. uh, and he was about five minutes into his set, and a man, uh, two men walked in, and they sat right in the front row, put their feet up on the stage, and crossed their arms, and they just weren't laughing. And Greg made it his mission to get those guys to laugh. And he claims that after a few minutes, he had them laughing. And after his set, he met them at the bar and he was chatting with them. And he said, hey, have you guys been in the club before? And they said, no, but we passed it every day for eight weeks. And he said, really? What, what, why would you pass it every day for eight weeks? Well, they said, they explained, by the way, it, was, it turned out it was, it was a father and son. Uh, mm -hmm. They had walked by the club every day because they were going to the hospital across the street because their wife and mother had been diagnosed with breast cancer. Wow. And they, they, they said that, you know, they, they never came into a club because they, they were spending the day with the wife and talking to the doctors. And they were so exhausted at the end of the day that all they could do is eat and go to sleep. And Greg asked, um, how's she doing? And the son kind of teared up and said, well, mom died. Uh, and, and we're just, you know, clean, you know, taking care of uh, the final business. And, you know, he says, we hugged and, you know, we cried together. And then the father said, Greg, thank you so much this is the first time in eight weeks that we felt even halfway human. Robin Williams said it. You never know how you're going to affect somebody else by giving them the gift of laughter. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's so powerful how you can touch people's lives and not know it, right? Like just the impact that we can have on people. Yep. Yeah. So on that note, I would ask you, if you had the attention of the whole world for five minutes, what would you tell them? Wow. Uh, send money. That would be good. <laughs> Uh, the, the Goldberg Children Co College Fund is still right. like, taking donations. Um, if I could, if I could use some fairly foul language, I'd say get your shit together. Uh, the world is out of its mind, not just here in America, although we are completely nuts. But get your shit together. There's no reason why we can't all live together in peace. I don't mean to be all hairy fairy here, but you know, it, it, there, all this crap's just not necessary. Israel and Ukraine and Russia and all that stuff, and our politics here in America is just out of control. I mean, yesterday it, there were, there were fist fights uh, threatened in, in Congress. I mean. It, it, it just doesn't have to be that way. So how about lightening up, laugh a little bit and be kind to each other. That, I think that's what I would say to everybody and send money. <laughs> and come see your next show. <laughs> Tonight at the Shore House in Long Beach. Awesome. Awesome. I love it. <laughs> so other than coming to the show, we should definitely go check them out. But how can listeners support you and your work? Where can they find you online and wherever else you are? Well, uh, if they're looking to support my comedy career, I post all that stuff on Facebook. But uh, if anybody's interested in sales training or sales coaching or any, as a matter of fact, if anybody just has any questions, uh, you know, look, I, I'm a little long in the tooth here. You see, there's a lot of gray hair. So I'm, I'm much closer to retirement than the beginning of my career. And I, I believe in giving back. So I'm always happy to help people, uh, not necessarily to charge them money. Any, any of your listeners are welcome to call me, email me, text me. Uh, with a quick question. I mean, I can't spend five hours a day on, on the phone with everybody without charging something, but uh, uh, you can find me on LinkedIn, certainly. And uh, my website is uh, jgsalespro.com. And my email is jeff at jgsalespro.com. And people are welcome to call me directly on my cell, which is 516-314-9037. By the way, uh, I have a sales group on Facebook, and you don't have to be a professional salesperson. You could be that entrepreneur that I was talking about who just needs how to sell. We've got about 1300 sellers on there right now. And every Friday morning at 10 a.m., I do a live interview with somebody who can add value to the profession of sales. And that streams to my LinkedIn feed, to my Facebook group, and to my YouTube channel. So I'm, I'm pretty easy to find. Absolutely. And we'll have all the links below for everybody to come check it out. And thank you, Jeff, for being on. This was a blast as always, but I really appreciate it. Oh, thanks so much for having me. And I hope everybody has a wonderful Thanksgiving. Absolutely. And me as well. And if you found value in this episode, please do share it. That's how people find us. And you can find me at sevenfigurebuilder.com. And I look forward to seeing you on the next episode. Bye.